Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the people most focused on shifting the way we think about the future. Today, we've got somebody who's definitely doing that, David Orbit on the program. David's a blockchain guy with a ton of experience that we're going to dive into and we're going to replace all this anyways. So without further ado, David, how's it going? Very well. Thank you very much for having me on the show. So David, you were in blockchain really early. I saw 2010 investing in Bitcoin. Uh, 2011, 2010, yeah, whatever. The, the, you know, the, the exchange rate uh, with respect to the US dollar was uh, really very, very low then. And, you well, know, as time, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, single digits or less than a dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, it, it's funny because uh, I have been also very vocal about my belief that uh, Bitcoin will be important and blockchain with it uh, beyond Bitcoin too. And as I speak at a lot of conferences, I would tell people uh, to get involved, to get their hands dirty. And uh, it, maybe a year later, somebody would come back and say, oh, my God, David, uh, I, I heard you tell me that I should do this and I didn't listen to you. Now it's too late. Bitcoin is ten dollars. And then somebody would say, uh, you know, a year later, oh, my God, I wish I listened to you. Now it's too late. Bitcoin is one hundred dollars. And then the, the same thing would happen at $1,000. And I'm sure uh, that uh, if uh, it is going to be at $100,000, there will still be people who are reluctant. Um, and and, and a, a very sad uh, misunderstanding is that too few people realize that contrary to, to how you buy shares on the, on the stock market, you can buy uh, a fraction of a Bitcoin, you know, uh, uh, fractional uh, uh, share trading is becoming a thing more and more. But with Bitcoin, there is no problem buying uh, $10 worth of Bitcoin, regardless of what is the value of the entire thing. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a common misconception people have. And the space is, has gone a lot of ways. Um, so I'm sure if you invested early, you've probably made out really well, but you've probably sold some over the way. How, how's your journey been in terms of watching the community grow and I imagine watching your net worth go up? I am uh, very uh, proud of uh, the war scars. Uh, uh, I still am receiving the Japanese language bankruptcy notification uh, from the Mount Gox uh, brouhaha, right? Uh, uh, I invested in the Dow. Uh, $150 million uh, uh, for a suite of smart contracts that were very, very ambitious to create a decentralized autonomous organization, the decentralized autonom autonomous organization. And as it turns out, uh, a little too ambitious uh, at the time. And maybe it is still the case. We were not that good in writing smart contracts that would be bug free. And there was a bug in the DAO smart contract suite that allowed somebody to, to just take 50 million from the 100 million. And, uh, you know, when you discover a bug in, in, in a product that uh, Google or Apple uh, ship and you let them know, they pay you a bug bounty, uh, maybe $100,000, sometimes $200,000 or even more. Well, it turns out we paid a $50 million bug bounty. It's kind of a big number. Or even, you know, more recently, as in 2017, uh, uh, tokens and ICOs uh, uh, were the craze uh, in terms of utility tokens. And the next craze is already around the corner with security tokens. Um, uh, the people who uh, invested uh, at the, with the expectation that in a very short amount of time, they would uh, uh, be able to, to, to gain uh, uh, multiple... Uh, times what uh, what they invested, were able to say they were smart if they sold uh, before uh, January 2018. But uh, at any point after that, until uh, the date of our recording, at the end of November 2018, things were just going down, 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 and down. But uh, uh, I have a long-term view. I have a thousand-year plan. I don't uh, uh, allow myself to be frazzled by uh, the... Uh, little uh, accidents of, of, of our journey that are not only uh, unavoidable, they are, generally speaking, even desirable because um, nobody knows what 
are the sustainable business models and solutions that are going to be created in the blockchain world, uh, which means that what we need to do as a community is to try the maximum number of possible solutions, including the ones that don't work unavoidably. Right. So I, I, I feel just fine uh, as how things are going. I want to get in deeper into blockchain in a sec, but first I need to double click on something. You said you had a, a thousand year time horizon. Explain that and why so long. I could see having a hundred year time horizon, assuming humanity maybe will be living that much longer. But why a thousand years? That seems a bit too much. Well, um, I divide uh, the um, age of the universe in three uh, chunks. Um, um, and, and I don't only mean the uh, semi uh, line that goes from today to back to the Big Bang. I mean the entire uh, duration. Um, 13.7 billion years from Big Bang to today, uh, when a chunk of atoms or actually two chunks of atoms are talking to each other and... Uh, doing things, having dreams, uh, uh, big ambitions, or uh, just a desire to, to understand. Uh, and whether this lasts a um, uh, hundred years or a million years, uh, there will be uh, another uh, period of time when uh, our respective uh, atom clouds are going to dissolve and uh, the universe will keep going, right? That is why I feel such a joy and, 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 and so much passion and curiosity about what is happening today because it really disappears in, a, in an eye blink uh, with respect to those uh, two incredibly long time horizons. Now, when I say a hundred years or a million years, actually, I mean it in the sense that I have friends, Obidra Gray or, or whoever else, who are working on uh, making the uh, human lifespan arbitrarily long uh, and uh, uh, it is conceivable whether in our biological form or in an alternative substrate that uh, uh, our uh, desire to understand the universe can continue so in that perspective uh, i think that a thousand years is relatively modest but uh, if uh, you are curious i can tell you what the plan is i see i see I, I'm very skeptical of the thousand year time horizon, but I could definitely see both of us living for another hundred years, which in and of itself, most people would find fantastically improbable. I, I'm very skeptical as well of the substrate or the, the brain, aug, um, not augmentation, essentially uploading your conscious to some type of device just because of how far we off are off from understanding what consciousness actually is. Well, but as I, well as the fact that, that it is natural for that guy not to be you, right? Maybe it is going to be conscious. Maybe it will take a million years before we are able to do that. Or we will stop caring and we will not even try to do it, even if it were possible. But if it were, uh, you would look at the guy and, and maybe a little bit jealous as he goes and uh, uh, travels uh, among the stars. You are left behind on Earth and you say, hmm, shock, that is not me. Well, for me oh. for me i was going to say it's a bit like the story of heaven you can say whatever you want to say but there's no way to prove it and if you can't prove or disprove something it's not real so if you can't prove or disprove that this person is you you will never know so it's not like it matters anyways but it kind of does matter anyways and we will have very pragmatic ways of understanding how our behaviors and social contracts uh, will have to adapt to a world where we will have multiple instances of the same people going around making decisions in a divergent, independent way from each other. Uh, you would be able, for example, to think a secret uh, uh, number and then realize that the carbon copy walking around of you knows that secret number. And uh, if you grew up in a society that had uh, those kinds of rituals, for you it would be very easy to actually nod and say, but yeah, that guy is me. Um, the uh, profound shifts uh, in, in society happen because of uh, technology. And uh, the saying, uh, uh, nihil novum sub sole, there is nothing new under the sun, uh, can be true for certain periods of time, but over longer periods of time is absolutely false. 
And sometimes there are moments in the history of the world and of the universe where things actually accelerate. And uh, this uh, between the 20th and the 21st century is one of those amazing uh, moments where Keplerian relativism actually doesn't hold. You know, it's not that we could say, oh, you drop a pebble on the, on the timeline and wherever it stops, well, things are going to be more or less the same. Sometimes, yes. Uh, if you were born uh, uh, in the Middle Ages, um, you would be a farmer. Your father would be a farmer. Your child would be a farmer. And you would not be able to observe uh, any change, statistically speaking, around you. But uh, as uh, our grandparents and parents uh, tell us, and we are experiencing in person, uh, things are uh, truly changing uh, in, in this period of time. Well, it's exponential innovation. It takes forever to build up, but then it changes in an instant. And when you layer exponential technologies like we have now, suddenly you have something that is, in my mind, unpredictably, explosively accelerating. And, and, and that unpredictability is important because, uh, you know, when I uh, meet uh, startups and I try to help uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, achieve their dreams or uh, when I am invited to help uh, uh, boardrooms at uh, corporations uh, dictate the right kind of strategy to their management, well, the Soviet-style five-year plan or the business plan that the startups uh, painstakingly put together to tell investors that they know what they are going to do three years hence is just completely delusionary, exactly because of the interaction uh, of the rapidly changing uh, environment where each component is uh, immersed uh, in uh, not only its own dynamic, but in a noisy environment where um, it, is, it is impossible, uh, genuinely impossible to predict the outcomes. Uh, that is why to go back uh, to uh, the world of blockchain, the role of regulators is uh, so hopelessly um, uh, impossible. It's a thankless job because uh, they are appointed or elected to uh, do something that uh, nobody can do, including them, uh, to understand before the fact what the implications of these new technologies are going to be. And uh, most of the time, uh, they cannot afford to be honest enough to say they don't know. I think there's an even larger problem, especially in the blockchain side, and that's you have to get the incentives right initially or everything is screwed. If we were to try to create a game of Monopoly and for some reason there was one little flaw, one little bug, that bug becomes the defining characteristic that transforms the future of the game. That's why I think governance is incredibly important with blockchain. But even then, it may not be enough if the system's not set up optimally. Um, yes and no. I absolutely agree that governance uh, uh, is now becoming a digital technology. And uh, finally, you know, when uh, Winston Churchill quipped that democracy is the worst kind of government except every other kind, uh, we thought that the old guy was joking. Uh, he wasn't. He, uh, he, he, he was challenging us and we let him down for the next uh, 80 plus years and only now we are courageous enough or starting to be, and we have um, hopefully the ability to produce uh, the, 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 the thought leaders that can imagine with the help of technology, new technology, alternatives that are better suited to the needs of the 21st century. Uh, but uh, blockchain evolves too. Uh, there is nothing that stops uh, projects updating their code, including the governance of the code, and it happens. We call it forking, uh, soft forking, hard forking, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, and I welcome all those crazy experiments. Um, just as tokens, uh, I, I don't uh, deny that there are shrewd scammers that jump on the bandwagon uh, without any uh, intention of executing on their plans after they get uh, the money. Uh, but um, today, everybody's put uh, uh, in the same cauldron and uh, just because the market is dragging down the exchange rates of all of the tokens, 
um, it doesn't mean that an honest team uh, doesn't passionately want to do what they want to do. Uh, and given the uh, circumstances, now it is, it's harder, but they are still uh, keeping at it. So uh, that is why I, I, I am really um, optimistic about abil our ability to um, quickly evolve uh, the uh, uh, governance systems that uh, will um, give rise uh, to uh, robust uh, code uh, that uh, will be used to run our civilization. I think I think there's a very apt metaphor, and that would be religion and theology. If you look at the history of religion, we've had a couple of religions, primarily Judaism, Islam, then we had Christianity, which was Catholicism, then we split off and have Protestantism, and then we split off to a hundred little sects, and they all hate each other because they believe something slightly different. They all are trying to kill each other. There's wars. You have fighting. And you see, if you look into the history of most of the founders or a lot of the founders of these religions, a lot of them did it for less than ideal circumstances. I think you can metaphorize that or analogize that very well to what we see right now in blockchain. We have people with good ideas, others splitting off to start their own things, possibly for good ideas, more often than not for monetary gain. And it creates a situation where you have a lot of hatred and infighting between different different rivaling parties. I mean, we've seen that with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. We've seen that with a shit ton of the forks. How do you think about the future of Bitcoin and blockchain so that it doesn't suffer from the same things that religion does? Um, well, uh, I think that the analogy is funny, but uh, very rapidly uh, becomes uh, inapplicable exactly because um, the... Uh, dogmatic approach uh, of religions where uh, it is uh, not only impossible but uh, blas blasphemous to uh, check uh, uh, what their uh, tenets are, um, we can and we are constantly checking whether certain uh, blockchain uh, systems, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, what, uh, what their algorithms are, what their governance system is, what uh, kind of developer ecosystem they support, uh, what is the quality of the people and their ability and resilience uh, as they are involved. Well, uh, the, the fact that blockchains have very clear economic implications uh, naturally uh, tests uh, their viability in a feedback loop that uh, religions didn't have. So the evolution of blockchains is much faster. Uh, people who have a naturalistic uh, worldview can uh, flock to blockchains without having to give up their independent thought. It is not an act of submission. Uh, uh, it is not a one-way street. Uh, uh, if you want to exit uh, a given blockchain camp, uh, nobody hopefully will come and try to kill you. Um, yeah, I am optimistic about blockchain. Uh, I, I have been uh, speaking at conferences for all these years, uh, uh, and I have been ending uh, my talks uh, often uh, with uh, uh, an image about a future. I was uh, telling, hey, you know, I'm involved with Singularity University, have been for 10 years, and uh, I have friends who have created startups that are designing the, the infrastructure and, uh, and, and the crafts uh, to uh, mine the asteroid belt. So imagine in 30 years, we will have swarms of intelligent robots who will need uh, the economic transactions uh, to move material, uh, uh, buy fuel, uh, get access to bandwidth for communication, and among themselves to arrive to the right kind of consensus. So, yeah, absolutely, you are right. You have been sitting here at this conference skeptical about 90% what I was saying because you say, uh, well, we have banknotes, we have credit cards, we have checkbooks. What is this uh, blockchain anyway? So tell me, are those robots going to use checkbooks, banknotes, or credit cards to do the things that they've got to do? And for me, it is absolutely evident that none of that will... Uh, uh, be adequate uh, and something like what we call today blockchain and Bitcoin and whatever else is going to be used. And uh, it is um, 
uh, uh, already uh, visible, in my opinion, that uh, uh, even even on on Earth, uh, the uh, economy is getting decoupled uh, by the mere uh, uh, assumption that people are buying and consuming stuff, and that is what the economy is about. Um, we have an urgent need to rethink uh, uh, how uh, our ever-expanding understanding of, of the world and the universe can be compatible uh, with uh, the physical limits uh, of the planet. And we are uh, able to do so progressively uh, using uh, technology. And one of the technological implications of, of uh, these trends is that nano transactions among machines are going to constitute the next quadrillion dollars of uh, added wealth in the world economy. Um, and and uh, there are a lot of things that we, we can hardly imagine today, but uh, in the next 10, 20 years will become a daily part of our lives. Oh, absolutely. You've got autonomous vehicles. You need to go faster than someone else. You have to make micropayments to the cars in front of you to move over so that you can pass them more quickly. There, there's a ton of implications. Do you see the future? And, and I want you to answer this as a realist, not as an optimist, because I think we both have the same view as, a, as an optimist, that we would like to see blockchains remain decentralized. But do you think the future of blockchains, specifically the ones that get used primarily for payments and replacing the payment systems of the world. Do you think those will be centralized either under governments or companies, or do you think they'll be decentralized? So um, the incumbent uh, industry and regulatory systems of finance uh, are in panic, as demonstrated by the conscious decision of the state of New York to make it so that it would stop being the financial center of innovation of the world. They passed a few years ago the so-called bit license that makes it extremely hard, uh, extremely expensive to uh, create and maintain and, and make uh, compliant from a regulatory point of view uh, a blockchain startup that is in the world of payments competing with banks. Comparatively, Today, it is more expensive to do that than not opening a bank 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, this kind of excessive um, regulatory reaction is similar to your uh, immune system uh, if you are allergic to nuts that is ready to kill you rather than having you eat one. And uh, at the same time, uh, if we believe that these uh, shifts are unstoppable, uh, you can certainly accelerate or slow down the, the, the pace of uh, adoption of certain technologies in society, but you cannot call yourself out. Um, the current system has uh, some important uh, uh, flaws. Uh, for example, uh, China could uh, very easily say that uh, um, it is uh, illegal to export uh, the um, uh, cards uh, that are used for uh, Bitcoin mining. A and uh, they are, um, if, if they do that, uh, the, the people building those cards would not stop building them, but they would be deployed a a a only within mainland China. And uh, that would uh, unavoidably skew the, uh, um, the Bitcoin network uh, uh, mining operations to have uh, an excessive concentration in, in China. And, and that is why... Why do, you think they haven't done, why do you think they haven't done that? They uh, underestimate uh, uh, how uh, disruptive Bitcoin is going to be. Uh, two, three years ago, both uh, China and, uh, and Russia were very proud that uh, they were about to sign uh, legislation that would prohibit Bitcoin. And then they realized that they cannot prohibit mathematics, right? Uh, but but uh, today they are still living under the assumption that uh, they they can uh, they can control or or, or mitigate its uh, its disruption. In the U.S., is the same thing, uh, where um, the latest uh, enforcement activity by the SEC 
uh, is uh, making uh, software developers culpable for the code they write, even when this code is running autonomously. Uh, and and uh, so they find a kind of a choke point in order to be able to control what is uh, going on, what is uh, allowed, what is not allowed. I would not be surprised for a Supreme Court um, case uh, to be heard uh, soon uh, where the question is going to be uh, whether uh, code as uh, free speech uh, is protected under the First Amendment uh, uh, in the case of then code executing autonomously uh, uh, in, in a somewhat uh, similar way like uh, Citizens United uh, protected uh, um, uh, free speech by corporations for giving donations to political parties. Uh, now, I'm not saying that there are easy solutions. I did say just uh, before that regulators have a, an impossible job. But uh, I was in Malta uh, a few weeks ago at the introduction of the comprehensive digital ledger technology framework by the Maltese uh, uh, government and met the, the Minister of Finance. And they were uh, very uh, excited uh, to be able to replicate the success they've had for um, the um, uh, correct uh, and delicate management of a technology like uh, online gaming, where they've been successful for the past 15 years, and apply that experience to the world of, uh, of blockchain too. Do you think? Realistically, I would say a couple of points for that. I would never underestimate the Chinese government. I think that's incredibly dangerous. If I've seen any government that's willing to think further out and seems to be if not always ahead of the curve, rapidly accelerating past the curve once they realize they're behind. I think I would see most governments around the world, if they see that blockchain becomes or is going to become an eventuality, which I think a lot of countries will. Some are doing that now. Sweden's already working on potentially implementing their own crypto style currency that the, the government controls. It would be a bit like the it would be a bit like the Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat deal. Snapchat had a great product, kids loved it. Facebook had the audience, copied the product. Now everyone uses Instagram instead of Snapchat. I see something, unfortunately, I, I would not like that. I would like for cryptocurrencies and blockchain to remain decentralized and part of the people to get rid of some of the inherent issues with today's system. But I don't see that happening. I see governments essentially corrupting or stealing the movement and saying, okay, this is the new US dollar and it's it's uh, cryptographically based and here are the rules more or less the rules are exactly the same as the us dollar although it's done via micro payments and much smaller amounts so that you're able to have that flexibility while also still having the backing of the government blockchain is not the only technology that is pointing in a certain direction whether nation states are happy with that or not it is part of a very broad trend uh, i believe and that is the fundamental thesis of network society the group of inif initiatives that uh, several years ago I, I founded, uh, that uh, there is a, a fundamental phase transformation in our socio-economic organization underway. And that this transformation is supported by technologies that are maturing and that make the transformation unstoppable. And uh, I have identified eight uh, uh, uncorrelated uh, industrial economic sectors where they, we already have technologies and examples very, very powerfully and robustly uh, uh, making, making headway. Uh, solar technology in uh, energy, uh, digital manufacturing, um, uh, hydroponics, uh, synthetic meat, peer-to-peer um, -peer health, uh, uh, personalized health, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, um, uh, trust networks uh, like Airbnb and Uber that, in my view, don't compete with um, hospitality or transportation. They actually compete with police because they uh, support uh, a, a kind of uh, a natural interaction and experience on a worldwide basis that is uh, a really uh, different than what uh, has been possible before. Um, the um, biggest... Um, Challenges are certainly in finance uh, being disrupted by, by blockchain and by uh, the governance uh, systems that need to be uh, updated and upgraded as well. 
um, I, I do believe that uh, we have the opportunity to give um, people all around the world um, the ability to learn uh, 21st century life design skills that will empower them to be an active participant uh, in our civilization rather than uh, feeling uh, left out or uh, uncomprehending how to decode uh, what uh, is happening uh, around them. And uh, at Network Society, we are actually building uh, a suite of applications that uh, are going to enable uh, everybody to, to do exactly that, together with dozens of uh, partner projects. Uh, and uh, we are granting uh, tokens, both uh, Network Society tokens and the partner tokens, uh, to um, uh, make sure that uh, uh, as they provably learn uh, what they uh, want to do, um, they hit the ground running. Uh, this is actually phase uh, one of the Network Society Master Plan. I think there's one danger when it comes to belief or desire for something. And I think the analogy, again, holds, holds well with religion. So personally, I really want the vision of the world that you have to be what happens with the world. I think a world where we have a more decentralized government, where we get rid of a lot of the governmental and financial-based, essentially, corruption around the world and have a more unified civilization is the direction we need to be going. It's not, A, the direction I feel like we're going. I feel like we're very much going in the opposite direction. And B... I think it suffers from the same thing at the at the belief. It, it's the same problem as when you go and buy a Ford Focus, and suddenly you see everyone that has Ford Focus. You're looking for something because you've consciously identified it. Now, when you believe in something, not only are you looking for examples of that, you're also looking for examples that disprove the other theories. So, I believe you. I want what you're saying to happen, and yet I don't feel it, despite the added the added uh, psychological triggers that would make me want to believe that. And I think a lot of people in blockchain and a lot of people in startups in general suffer from that, blockchain especially, though. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, we have been told that mega corporations and larger and larger aggregations of nations, the European Union, NAFTA, the United Nations, are going to dominate the planet from an economic and from a political point of view. And that is not the case. It is very idealistic according to the worldview of those who feel that a hierarchical structure can decide what is right for everybody else. But we have examples already of, of how that is not what it is happening. I've been in India in a McDonald's. And McDonald's, even though it is one of the most successfully um, systematized uh, uh, companies in terms of how they do what they do, never dreamed of uh, serving ground up sacred cows uh, in their buns. They have vegetarian hamburgers and chicken hamburgers, uh, breaking the homogene homogeneity of their offering. Um, the European Union has this concept of devolution, where every decision must be made at the lowest possible level. Um, in Italy, where I'm uh, speaking to you from today, uh, a lot of things are not decided by the Italian government, but are decided uh, by the regional governments, including health, education, important things that impact uh, everybody's life on the ground. So um, I, I think that uh, uh, we are not running the danger of uh, uh, just waking up one day and, and, and realizing that our world has been uh, reduced uh, to a small set of choices. And doesn't matter where we are, uh, that set uh, doesn't change, and, and uh, since uh, we were born, uh, it is uh, going to be uh, uh, like, like that. And I uh, firmly support the view that, uh, that uh, uh, a government is the expression of a society that is made possible by a technology. And then it can close the circle and ask itself, 
what are the implications and the applications of those technologies and how can we steer them in desirable directions. But uh, the strongest force is actually technology itself. Uh, when the Roman slaves were building the Colosseum, there was no alternative. If you went and asked one uh, if uh, his life was just, uh, he would have punched you. And then if you followed up, but do you see an alternative? After a second punch, he would have said, look around. Uh, if I refuse, I will be killed. And the next guy is going to move this rock. But this rock needs to go there. And we've got a Coliseum to build. And there is no alternative. And I don't know whether the building where you are speaking from today has uh, one story or a or hundred stories. But I bet it wasn't built by slaves. And similarly, there are uh, very strongly held views about society today that will be as laughably wrong as for someone to assume that our skyscrapers must be built by slaves. Um, let me give you a couple. Today, two things uh, are completely outside of uh, uh, our degrees of freedom and our opportunities for choice. And these things are supremely important in so many things that go on in our lives. One of them is um, uh, your genetic makeup. And the other is the place where you are born and you become citizen of because of being born there. Um, and both of these, in a future society, um, supported by novel technologies, will become... Will, will, will enter the sphere of uh, our sovereign decisions as individuals. Uh, and uh, no, uh, when you are two years old, you are not going to decide or for uh, what your genetic makeup should be. And uh, moving around freely on the planet will uh, be um, implemented in a way that is compatible with the scarce uh, geographical resources that we have available. Seven billion people is not going to fit in Manhattan even if we wanted to let everybody go wherever they wanted anytime. Um, it, but uh, it will be seen as barbaric that uh, today so many uh, people suffer because we don't have the technologies to uh, improve their lives uh, and, and, and their defective genes. And it will be seen as barbaric that uh, whether education or health or, or, or uh, purpose uh, is restricted because you've been born in a geographical location that uh, doesn't uh, give you those opportunities. And I agree with you in a lot of your worldviews. A big part of the reason I'm pushing you on this is because I want to see that future happen. And I think that when people have these type of conversations, it goes one of two ways typically not this way typically it's we're both very believing of the same thing and kind of spouting off about how great the world will be or we're both very cynical and we're hopping on fox news and saying how the future uh, the past used to be better keep and i think pushing, it, keep pushing let's I fight, think it's let's valuable. fight. i yeah, like yeah, it. yeah absolutely absolutely how do how do we get to that world right now when it feels like everything is becoming more isolationist and i know part of that is essentially a sine curve things go up and down we're reactionary creatures but how do we move towards that, use technology, and change society in a way for the better going forward? One of the most important things that we can and must tell everybody is that they matter. As individuals, their views, their suffering, their uh, aspirations really matter. Independently of their beliefs uh, or, or their decisions or political affiliations, we can't tell people that, uh, that they are stupid, that uh, whatever they think is, is worthless. Uh, ISIS is a fantastic answer for people who give up hope and who say, you uh, can't tell me that I don't have any impact. I will show you the impact I have. And, and uh, they are people are ready to die to show that they matter, right? So why don't we uh, embrace differences in opinions? 
but start from building the confidence for people to look at the world in the future uh, in a manner that sees them protagonists, that gives them the tools uh, to make informed choices. Um, and, and, and of course, there are extremely shrewd operators who thrive uh, on uh, the condition of millions of people who are easily manipulated because their critical faculty is not supported by um, uh, tools that they can use and access uh, and, and, and they go with the flow, right? And they don't check the sources and they um, jump on the bandwagon of a, a very uh, attractive and addictive message. Uh, and uh, don't look back. Or when they look back and say, oh my God, uh, I, I, I voted Brexit, but I didn't realize what I was doing. Can we vote again? No, nope, sorry, that was it. You already voted. Um, uh, and, and, and by the way, Brexit is incredible. Brexit, I, I hate it. I hate it. But isn't it incredible? 150 years ago in the United States, a bunch of uh, 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 Americans said they wanted to secede and regardless of the reason of slavery or whatever else the others said what What do you want to do? I'd rather kill you than let you secede uh, and that's what they did civil war um, we don't have a constitution for the European Union unfortunately because the attempts to create one were voted down by the Czech Republic and the Netherlands. So what uh, the European Union has is the so-called Lisbon Treaty, which is a 600-page monstrosity uh, rather than a slim and inspiring constitution. Uh, but hidden in the Lisbon Treaty, there is Article 50, which the United Kingdom invoked. And it is the first time in the history of civilization where an entity, uh, a political entity, is confident enough to say, uh, we think we are doing the right things, but if you don't want to belong, you're free to go. Nobody will kill you. And there is no war as of right now between the EU and, and, uh, and the United Kingdom. There is no bloodshed. There is no fight. There is no... It's mind-blowing. It's fantastic. I think they are doing a stupid thing and, and maybe they will uh, ask to rejoin the EU in another 50 years or maybe it will turn out that those that uh, uh, felt uh, uh, the UK should remain were wrong. Well, no, you know, we'll see. We'll see. But the fact that they can do it without bloodshed and a war is fantastic. I think a big part of that, though, is because they're not economically subsidizing the rest of the EU. So, for instance... Let's let's play a thought experiment out. What would happen if California decided to secede from the U.S.? This, there's been talk of this. It's probably not going to happen. And probably the reason is because the U.S. would essentially, hey, guess what? We have the bigger, we have the bigger stick, right? Uh, well, um, the, the, the U.S. Uh, um, Constitution doesn't allow uh, states uh, to secede. Um, so until uh, the U.S. Constitution is uh, amended to allow that, uh, California can do whatever political uh, circus, uh, but it will be empty theater. Um, uh, the economic levers um, are certainly complex, and just because the uh, U.K. may be out of uh, the EU in a few months, it doesn't mean that the interflow of products and services will, will stop. Uh, maybe it will be harder, there will be uh, taxes and tariffs uh, that weren't uh, there before, but uh, uh, the, 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 the physical island is not uh, going to become an autocracy that uh, stops trading uh, uh, with the rest of the world. Not even uh, North Korea is uh, isolated economically, not even Cuba uh, is isolated economically, let alone the UK. It, it reminds me a bit of Catalonia. So uh, my wife and I spent a few months in Barcelona and on her birthday, we were going somewhere and accidentally realized that it was uh, the Catalonian Independence Day and ended up in the middle of a mass protest with helicopters flying overboard. 
a few months later, they decided to vote in Catalonia for independence, which the Spanish government cracked down on. You see videos of the police beating the shit out of protesters, kicking them, tackling them. And I think that you would see this in a lot of places. I think cities are gaining power significantly versus countries. The vast majority of the economy in Spain comes from the Catalonia region, Barcelona in particular, the US, you have New York, you have San Francisco, you have LA, you've got a couple of the, the cities in uh, Texas, et cetera. And you see it around the world, these mega cities that are driving the future. Do you see cities ultimately replacing or in some way subjugating the, the governments, the nation states of today? Uh, phase two of the network society master plan in 10 years, more or less, uh, or, or sooner, is going to be when the number of users of our Nets app uh, uh, suite uh, is going to be uh, in, in, in large enough numbers that uh, we can turn on something that they suspected, they started to understand the uh, political agency that participating in the network uh, endows those users. Uh, and uh, whether we call it voting or polling or whatever else, it doesn't matter. What matters is our products and services provided through that kind of mechanism going to be more convenient uh, or, or uh, uh, richer, uh, whatever is, is, is the uh, axis that we measure uh, uh, the, the, the implications on, if I choose because I was in trouble in, in Bangkok not to go to the consulate of the country of my citizenship for help, but I tap on my phone or whatever the de device is gonna be maybe implanted in my brain in 10 years. And what today we would call magically help appears out of the network, uh, that is the moment when the nation state can keep doing it's thing, you know, the parliaments, the elections, and of course paying taxes because yes, they've got the guns, but um, the uh, evolution of our social contract is going to be rapidly decoupling uh, from, from, uh, from their decisions. And cities represent uh, the initial nodes of this network um, to the point where uh, uh, Bloomberg, uh, the former mayor of uh, New York, created an organization uh, interconnecting 40 of the largest cities who have challenges that move them closer to each other than not to their respective countries in terms of how to face uh, the future. Would you see some, let's, let's play the, let's play the scenario I got out again. Let's say something like this was to happen. Bloom, Bloomberg's a great leader when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Would it be possible, in your opinion, for several U.S. states or for a number of cities in some type of nation-state grouping to secede from the U.S. or from other countries peacefully within the next five, ten years? No, and it doesn't matter. It is not even desirable because we will build uh, um, infrastructure and superstructure that is, one, practically invisible uh, or uh, uh, un unfathomable to the nation state. And, and two, makes us uh, coexist uh, with those that don't, don't see it, but on a, on a completely different plane. Let me give you an example. Imagine that I, I, I live in, a, in, a, in an independent house uh, and um, at the gate, um, I have a very nimble and eager robotic arm. And as I eat, um, you know, um, I don't know, a Mars bar, I've never eaten a Mars bar, but uh, uh, I, I, am, I am a dirty know-nothing. And then I throw the, the, the package, right? And the robotic arm catches it and, and, and looks at it and analyzes it. And already as it is analyzing the piece of garbage that I created, it is summoning a self-driving vehicle whose carrying capacity is proportional to the piece of garbage. Uh, maybe it comes in a minute, maybe it comes in an hour, doesn't matter. Uh, they already are negotiating the nanotransaction. Maybe it's half a cent, maybe it's uh, a, a tenth of a cent. The self-driving vehicle takes over the, the piece of garbage, and this happens 
maybe during nighttime when the robotic arm sifts through the garbage can, maybe it happens continuously. Maybe the road is a river of these self-driving uh, um, minuscule supply systems. But on one hand, the circular economy created by this to totally eliminates the concept of waste, which in nature doesn't exist. It is a completely uh, stupid uh, correlate of our ignorance about how to uh, manage our economy. Um, and transaction by transaction, by the very fact of living in my home, I finance it. Right? So, oh, and of course, the nano transaction between the robotic arm and the self driving okay. thing is blockchain, duh, right? Mm -hmm. So, so can something like this happen? Maybe the numbers are wrong, uh, you know, no, I won't finance my house, but I would just de, um, you know, um, diminish the, 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 the cost uh, uh, each month or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. It is absolutely possible. Uh, is this something that we need a nation state in order to develop it? No, no. And there will be other things that nation states are also going to be un totally incapable of, of, of deciding about. And that is phase three of the Network Society Master Plan. As we uh, continue developing this beautifully rich tapestry of human-machine interactions, a hybrid civilization that is colonizing Mars, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, placing outposts uh, on uh, Ganymede uh, or the asteroid belt, it is so evident that uh, uh, the... Um, biological, environmental, economical, and social adaptation needed on those different places uh, are, are not going to be under a hierarchical system where the rules are centrally de designed and decided. They are going to live uh, very differently from, from each other. Uh, I wrote uh, an essay a few years ago uh, that the uh, Mars colony could be uh, financed uh, uh, on, on the blockchain, and of course it could. Uh, actually, we have today the fake Elon Musk's uh, saying, uh, give me uh, uh, Ether and I will give you many Ether back. Uh, and uh, there are so many that uh, doing it now, it would be even hard because of uh, outcrowding the real Elon Musk that could do it. But um, then Mars is going to declare their independence by uh, seeding their own blockchain. The genesis block of the Martian blockchain is going to represent symbolically, but also concretely, their independence, interdependence too, from, from Earth. And this hybrid civilization is going to saturate uh, the, the solar system, uh, and that is going to take 100 years, uh, more or less, um, uh, biological humans will uh, be part of it in a proportion that uh, uh, we could feel frighteningly small uh, today. Uh, you know, the number of humans may uh, move uh, from um, uh, rounding it up 10 billion to 100 billion, uh, but the number of uh, smart machines, uh, whether self-aware or not, doesn't matter, uh, will be... Um, you know, probably something like six order of magnitude more than, than humans, a million machines per, per human. Uh, and um, the decisions will have to be taken by consensus. And that is uh, phase four of the Network Society Master Plan. How do we arrive to the next uh, level of consensus in a thousand years or less uh, to uh, decide that we must uh, uh, devote um, uh, um, a pretty large proportion of uh, the energy budget of the solar system uh, in order to answer uh, the Fermi paradox. Uh, are we alone in the universe or not? And independently from uh, the answer, uh, embark on the next uh, phase of the journey. But uh, uh, I am uh, uh, humble enough not to have a fifth uh, phase of the master plan. So I will leave that out. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a black hole. It's a event horizon. It's hard to predict beyond. So, in terms of in terms of post Earth or not post Earth, but other other celestial colonies, places, etc. 
to, to clarify, you think everything will be some type of decentralized democracy? Well, uh, Aristotle is uh, uh, actually, uh, or maybe it was even Plato, um, had Politeia as uh, uh, the well-functioning uh, government and democracy was actually a, 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 a deformation, a deterioration of, of, of that. Uh, and uh, many of us are very unhappy with the outcomes that uh, democratic processes are producing. You know, uh, we wish certain elections would have been the product of frauds. <laughs> it is so uh, uh, despairing that they were not. Because we look at our fellow um, members of society and we go like, oh my God, how can you vote like that, right? Um, uh, no, I really believe that we will produce uh, um, uh, social systems and uh, as a consequence, political systems and as a consequence, governments and governance uh, that will be much better than not what uh, today's representative uh, democracy uh, the world over. Definitely. I was what I was going to say is I imagine different colonies will have different political structures. Oh, so yeah. I, they, I can, not I can see all China, the, same. the Chinese system will definitely be something that is very prevalent, I would imagine, because of the nature of living in space. So we had we had someone on the program, I think it was Eric Ward. And it was he was talking a bit about the differences between living on Earth and living in space, living in space. The rules have to be so set in stone. Because if you have someone who, for whatever reason, decides not to contribute, they're wasting air, they're wasting precious resources. Eventually, you have to have that conversation. When do we throw this sucker out? Um, uh, love it. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to be in the company of those uh, utilitarian maximalists. Um, I do believe that wasting time, being bored, uh, uh, daydreaming are extremely important human activities. And whether I do it on Earth or uh, in space, I use air. And uh, just because we don't measure it, uh, the amount of air on Earth is not unlimited here. So uh, according to that guest, I could be justified keep being kicked off from Starship Earth. Um, but uh, I don't uh, feel that it is going to be a problem at the beginning, absolutely. It is very hard to imagine that, uh, that a space colony at the, at the beginning, beginning wouldn't be almost militaristic, right? Uh, uh, of course. And, and uh, a lack of resilience and discipline and uh, um, persistent performance at peak um, is going to, uh, you know, mortally imperil the entire colony. Uh, if, uh, if, if it becomes, uh, you know, not even prevalent, but if, if more than just a tiny, tiny fraction uh, of, of those who are there uh, go, go about uh, their daily chores like that. And the, I don't know how uh, long this is going to last because we are not going to have uh, uh, space colonies that uh, depend on human performance. It, it, just, it just wouldn't work exactly because our um, reliability is so low. Uh, yeah, we have all kinds of error correcting mechanisms, but we cannot afford to build in uh, the, the system um, the expectation that some people will just simply go crazy. And if the breakdown of the colony is uh, such that, that too many people go crazy, um, and, and for example, we, we are still as ignorant as today about how to stop them from happening or cure them effectively, uh, expecting peak performance forever from everybody is just not going to work. So that is why sustainable space colonies are only going to work already when uh, the balance of uh, uh, machine agents uh, to human agents is uh, maybe not uh, a million to one, but probably a thousand to one. Um, because, yes, uh, we know how to build them to be pretty reliable. And uh, at least for now, they don't uh, complain about working too long hours or having to daydream rather than um, digging dirt. So we haven't built these systems, both politically, economically, socially, or en en engineering materials-wise currently. Is it fair to say that trying to 
expand to expand to Mars, expand to the moon colony now would be like taking an average Joe off the couch and trying to get him to run a an Iron Man. He's trying to do something impossible because he's never done it before and it's destined to fail. Well, it's guaranteed that we are destined to fail uh, until we are succeeding. And uh, if we cannot afford to fail, we will never succeed. Uh, we will pushing. We will be when we are pushing ourselves uh, to meet and exceed our limits. And uh, we don't know whether the time is right or we need another couple of hundred years before it succeeds. Uh, whatever uh, we are attempting, for example, uh, a Martian colony. Uh, when Leonardo designed the helicopter, he had to wait 500 years before uh, metallurgy and, and aerodynamics uh, could enable us to, uh, to, to, to prove him right. Um, uh, others were luckier and uh, maybe within their lifetime, uh, their incredible invention was, was realized. So, uh, yeah, we, we have a gazillion things that uh, we don't understand and will go wrong. Um, but one of the huge benefits uh, of a self-sustaining Martian colony is going to be to be able to uh, live better on Earth. Uh, the externalities that we are happily ignoring uh, in uh, our luxurious uh, Western-style lives that are now uh, happily uh, and deservedly embraced in India, China and Africa, uh, why shouldn't they eat meat or uh, have uh, heating or cooling? or use plastic, uh, uh, the fact that we are pretending that they are culpable and we are not is extremely um, uh, hypocritical. And, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but, but, but we will learn um, completely sustainable ways of living thanks to the Martian colonies and the level of luxury that they will actually gain through the technologies that are going to be necessary, otherwise they will not survive, will be admired on Earth. And initially, maybe Mars is going to have us pay 10 times what they cost because they will want, of course, to, uh, to, uh, to profit from their development, and they should. And then um, uh, Earth will be uh, transformed um, you know, just an example, uh, on Mars, we will have um, uh, synthetic meat and uh, uh, hydroponics. There's no way around it. You know, we will not have cows grazing uh, on the fields. Uh, one of the uh, implications of hydroponics and synthetic meat that we already know, because we are already uh, using those technologies, is that they consume uh, 10 times less resources in terms of energy, water, soil, uh, than traditional industrial agriculture. But what a lot of people don't realize is that they also transform food production from something that is uh, growing uh, in proportion uh, to the area occupied into something that uh, grows in proportion with the volume available. So, four billion years and life discovered local maxima for a lot of cool things. You know, uh, our eyes are incredible. And no, they are not the best eyes possible, but uh, they see as they need to. And uh, our brains are as big as they can be so that we can be born uh, and they do amazing things. But these local maxima in four billion years extended life, not more than a couple of kilometers uh, down or up from the surface. Uh, it is a very thin crust uh, on the planet. But through this transformation, we will be able to expand the biosphere by orders of magnitude. And yeah, the solar energy that we need to do that is available a thousandfold. So that will be an important lesson of the Martian colonies that Earth will uh, literally die for adopting. Because if it wouldn't, then it would die. I think your order of operations is wrong. I think it'll definitely happen on Earth before it happens on Mars. And then Mars will implement the effective systems. But, but other than that, I, I would agree. It's just typically... If I need to test a, a scuba tank, I don't test the scuba tank underwater. 
I test it above water first. Correct. But we, but of course, we'll, we'll see how that happens, and there will be different innovations that are forced on forced on the Martians. I think like clean meat, hydroponics, etc. We need to pretty much have those perfected before we try to pull them off in the wild. What uh, what technologies outside of the ones we've talked about today are you most interested in or excited about, and why? Um. I believe in the scientific method, and I believe in the evolution of scientific method. Um, I don't know if after fintech and regtech and, and whatever tech, uh, is there a, a startup funding um, group that talks about sci-tech? There should be. Because the methods of science, as we are practicing science today, are not optimal they can evolve much better. Uh, for example, a lot of scientists uh, have become bureaucrats, um, writing grant applications, uh, justifying how they are spending their money, crossing their fingers that uh, their colleagues or institutions are not going to fight them while they are going to try and do science. Uh, the reproducibility of scientific results is uh, pretty abysmal. Uh, negative results uh, uh, are, are completely undesirable, even though we uh, pretend uh, to maintain that nature is neutral and whatever answer it gives to our questions are equally worthy. Well, no, that is not exactly how it goes, because if you go back a year later and you tell to the grant making organization that uh, what you expected didn't happen, they will not give you the same amount of money saying, wow, well, well done, go and try again. That is not how it works, right? Um, and, and the reason why uh, this is uh, uh, unfortunate is because we have so much to understand. You know, uh, Gödel's uh, theorem proves that uh, the universe is an unending quest of constant exploration. Uh, when you have an undecidable statement in mathematics, you are entitled to take either true or false and add it to your platform as a new axiom to extend it. And then the applications of that extension are actually exploring the universe. It's almost uh, uh, because you love uh, uh, religious uh, analogies, uh, as if uh, we would say um, uh, at the beginning was the word. Because uh, the statement and the decision that we make uh, uh, around it opens up the universe in a given direction rather than the other. Now, what this means is that orthodox science is unnecessarily constrained and we may need to go faster in finding answers to existentially important questions we have. We have to be courageous enough to embrace heterodoxy. And that is why I am investing and supporting and, and advising projects that are impossible and, you know, I try to uh, separate scammers and, and uh, self-deluded madmen uh, from extremely uh, passionate and, and skilled scientists who are um, swimming against the flow. Official science says that earthquakes uh, uh, are impossible to forecast. And uh, one of uh, the companies I'm supporting uh, is uh, forecasting earthquakes through a completely novel uh, natural phenomenon uh, an hour in advance. Uh, science says uh, that uh, uh, room temperature fusion of atomic nuclei is impossible. And I am supporting uh, somebody who is exploring in uh, those directions. While at the same time, the EU is giving $40 billion dollars uh, for a project called ITER uh, that uh, will try to prove uh, hot fusion within the next tw 20 years. So uh, the challenge of how to reassign um, funding in a manner that can explore um, forgotten corners uh, of the universe in search of answers to exciting questions is a technology by itself that we have to improve. If we don't explore the impossible, we can never figure out what is possible. 
I think that's a, I think that's a really good place to start to wrap things up. I know you've got a ton going on. I need two last things from you before you tell people where to find you. The first is let's get a bold prediction on when that stage two happens of your, of your uh, network transformation. I know it's probably hard to go further out than that. So what would you say? Well, uh, the reason I say 10 years or sooner is because I thought I had 10 years and I realized that I, I didn't. Uh, this is more urgent than ever before. Uh, and we, we have to hurry up. So I expect that just as, you know, uh, William Gibson quips, uh, the future is already here, but just not evenly distributed yet. We will have uh, experiments in many different areas. And some of them are already ongoing. BitNation is a blockchain project where I invested and I'm an advisor. And BitNation uh, already is issuing passports for a decentralized virtual digital nation. And the Nets app uh, application suite wants to teach people how to take advantage of BitNation, of Sun Exchange, which does uh, solar cells where you can buy a single cell. I love that company. And, and sit in, in Norway uh, where it's uh, dark six months out of the year and you are literally streaming African sunshine in your digital wallet, right? Beautiful things. And, uh, and uh, in order to teach people how uh, their lives can be changed uh, 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 positively by, by, by these uh, is an urgent mission. And then tell them, you can... Um, act uh, consequently. So um, I don't mind going out on a limb and say that uh, rather than 10, it's going to be five. And then we can go back and say uh, in uh, 2013, uh, 2023, uh, whether I was right or wrong. Let's do it. I'll hold you to it so that you help us get there sooner. What is one thing you would want to leave people with? A quote called action. It could be anything. My personal slogan is, what is the question that I should be asking? Uh, information is more abundant than ever. Uh, knowledge can be massaged and manipulated. Uh, we have to be critical and skeptical. I want people to challenge me. Uh, I'm an optimist, uh, not uh, because I decided so. My genetic makeup and my uh, natural uh, environment made it so. But uh, there is no guarantee. I may very well be wrong, uh, whether it's a nuclear war or the asteroid that we didn't uh, bother uh, setting up telescopes to catch early enough uh, could uh, uh, kill humanity, right? Uh, I enjoy uh, the exploration of the opportunities we have. And, and, and I hope that not eight, but 80 or 800 billion uh, minds are soon going to be uh, enjoying that uh, uh, and and going everywhere. Uh, we are waking up the universe and uh, the uh, uh, atoms that uh, have been uh, unconscious, uh, not even sleeping for uh, 10 billion years and more are uh, one by one becoming part uh, of a rich uh, tapestry of uh, uh, thinking and, and passionate and creative uh, civilization. So I want uh, uh, your listeners to uh, be uh, as excited about that uh, as I am and ask all the questions that they can. And make those, make those impacts. I like that. That's a, that's a great takeaway for people. What about the best place to find you? Website, Twitter, the good stuff? DavidOrban.com, David Orban on Twitter, David Orban on uh, um, LinkedIn. On Facebook, I maxed out. Uh, I'm happy to chat, but I cannot accept, uh, 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 even though I have a, like a page, right? So you can like my page or, 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 or follow the page. I'm extremely easy to Google. I like public conversations. So if you send me an email, maybe I will respond, hey, fantastic question. Why don't we debate it in, 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 in the open rather than me just responding to you, which doesn't benefit uh, many, many more people. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, our conversation will lead uh, to those who watch it on YouTube or listen uh, to it on the various podcast platforms to indeed reach out. I, I, I like that. That's the idea to inspire people to think different and also to push, to push guests to think a little different because sometimes, sometimes that's helpful and they're usually awesome people doing incredible stuff. I think you qualify in that regard. 
disruptors.fm guys we'll have all the links and good stuff there if you want to check out david and the stuff he's working on but yeah thanks for coming today david this was a fun one thank you very much i enjoyed it too yeah cheers guys hope you enjoyed <laughs>